or still do, have a collection of vinyl records. Look around. I want you guys to notice. Look at this. A smattering of all over the place. Darren is downstairs, but he also has them. I know because I gave him some. I, I inherited some of my mom's old collection because she refuses to get rid of anything. I'm sorry, Mom, if you're watching this in the future. <laughs> but she knows. She knows her dilemma. And, but I've also gone on and bought my own. This was actually a birthday present from Allison to me. Uh, and because it's Stevie Nicks and she rules, we got the old school Stevie Nicks from Mom, you know. But the collection had all kinds of fun stuff. You know, Al Herbert and the Tijuana Brass. Yeah. You know? Yeah. A ton, and I mean a ton, of Barry Manilow. And I don't remember ever hearing Barry Manilow in my house. But it was all, we have like eight vinyls of it. I'm like, what are we doing here? This one, I didn't know that I liked this. We have two of these. I have two of these records, don't know why. But Baker Street on this, the saxophone in it alone is worth getting the vinyl, right? I feel like I'm, there's a YouTube channel that I watch called What's in My Bag, and it's people go to record shops and they pick out a bunch of vinyl and show you. I feel like I'm doing that a little bit. Alice and I went down to St. Louis recently, and there's a huge, there's a huge record shop, and we bought these two puppies uh, because you have to. I already had Cosmo Factory, but uh, I saw Bill Withers live, and I was like, I have to have that because, oh my gosh. The band is so good. I'm pretty positive it's raining when this is being recorded at some point outside, and he's like, thanks for coming out. It's so good. I mean, the band is just so good, and I love me some Bill Withers. This whole sermon is not on records, though. Um, <laughs> if you want it to be, we can talk about this stuff, um, but I won't put you guys through that. Also, that Bill Withers record is like a creamy yellow. It's great looking. <laughs> so <laughs> there's something about vinyl records that just draw me in. You get to look at them, you get to open them up, get to look at the liner notes, get to look at all the pictures. You don't get that when you hit play on Spotify. And something that I have noticed is that I've been doing that for years. Over half of my life I've been getting records. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but in 2021, there was a surge in vinyl record sales that it went in 2020, there were 21.5 million records sold. In 2021, 41.7 million vinyl records. Now, if you were part of the group that raised your hand because you used to have a vinyl record collection and you're sitting there going, man, I wish I would have kept them. I could have probably flipped these things on eBay. <laughs> you are probably correct. But what was crazy is, for the first time in 30 years, in 2021, vinyl records outsold CDs and digital album sales. Did you know that? And so that's really kind of cool. You wouldn't know that, but if you walk through Walmart now even, they have, a, they have a section. I've heard their pressings aren't that good, but I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> What's really interesting is Wall Street Journal had an article about this, and they were talking about the spike that has driven this is the youth, the younger generation, it's, it's millennials who are longing for a time in the past where they maybe remember their parents putting down a record and, and listening to them and they, they want to have a bit of nostalgia. And what's really happened is because of the stress of all of the different things going on in our world, the, pan the political strife, the pandemic that was happening, the, the growing numbers of young adults were spending more time nesting and seeking refuge in their past. And a clinical psychologist, he was quoted, or she was quoted, it doesn't say, in the article saying this, for millennials who favor vinyl albums, the format may offer them control and stability. You can hold the vinyl, you're responsible for making the music play, and perhaps it's reminiscent of a more certain time in their lives. With vinyl, there are no decisions to make. You put the record on, you sit back, and you listen. In a world so seemingly out of control, it's easy for us to go and grasp for some of it. 
for us to go and seek out some kind of control. When, when we see the things that we used to recognize our world or our country as, and we don't see that anymore, what we do is we start to revert or circle the wagons and try to gather it all to ourselves and try to control it. And what ends up happening is, in a world so seemingly out of control, I want you to know today there is only one who is really in control. So quit trying to take it from him. And I can tell you that the feeling of ambiguity and all of the things going on in the world has made me turn to things that make me feel like I can control that. And I have reverted to where I go, I'm not going to go and really experience anything new. That's another thing that people were studying is that in the midst of high anxiety, people don't watch new things. They go back and watch the old stuff, which is probably why Seinfeld has been on repeat a lot at my house. It was a simpler time. You just had to worry about getting in line and saying, soup, please, and get next. <laughs> no soup for you. So... I don't know about you, but the more I try to control, the less I feel in control. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe that's just me. Maybe some of you out there are like, you know, I think I got a pretty good handle on things. I think I'm in pretty good control of my domain. I'm the master of the house, whatever you want to say, another Seinfeld reference for you. But I want to challenge you to something today. I saw this on a British television show that aired 12 years ago. <laughs> this week. I want you to, everyone, while you're sitting there, I want you to take your right foot and I want you to spin it in a clockwise motion. We got that? In a clockwise motion. I, I promise you this isn't some sort of calisthenic that I'm sneaking in on you. Now, with your right hand in the air, write a six. <laughs> All right, everyone, restart. Cro cro clockwise right foot, now six. It will hurt your brain. You feel like you're in control. There is zero control. This is my leg. It's been my leg my entire life, and this is my hand. I can't make it not. The reason I want to bring that up today is because at the end of the day, we think we're in control, but control is an illusion. Say that with me. Control is an illusion. Hmm. Sorry. I'm just trying to make sure I'm going down the right path. Many of us want to know that we are in control or feel like we have control. So we create this facade of control in our lives, that we have these things that we manage, that we do these things. And so we, we convince ourselves that we're in control. But then time and time again, as life really happens, that is shed away. And what I want you to know today, and I know that this is hard to hear, but when you think of the places that you try to control the most in your life, it might be showing you your biggest areas of spiritual vulnerability. And that what you attempt to control most often reveals where you trust God the least. So let's walk with that for a second. I'm, I'm creating straw men of what the things that you might be trying to control in your lives. Or something that you have tried controlling in the past. Maybe it's someone in your family who is making bad choices it's a, it's a brother or a sister or it's a cousin and you're sitting there and you're trying to control what they're doing. Or maybe it's a, uh, let me find my notes. It's a, it's a child. Maybe your kid, you're wanting to control their outcome in life and you're saying, I'm, I want you to go down this path and so you do everything you can to get them to do that. You put them in every kind of activity that leads them down that path and you say, I'm going to get you controlled. I'm going to put you in a controlled environment. I'm putting these guardrails up so that you go down this path. And it's a facade. How about in marriage or your partner? We're having a marriage class that's going on right now. How many times in marriage does it feel like one of the partners is trying to control the other one, is trying to domineer the other one, is trying to tell them what to do, is trying to, is trying to by force or by, by uh, guilt or by shame or whatever it is, lead them down a path out of control? Or maybe it's your health. 
I'm going to work out as much as I can. I'm only going to eat kale and blueberries because those are superfoods, and I'm going to do all that. And then you go to the doctor, and you get a diagnosis, and you're like, oh, wait, that doesn't line up with how I've been living. My neighbor has been smoking six packs a day and eats only hot dogs. Why is it that they're healthy? Control is an illusion. Maybe it's your future where you're saying, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I will accomplish with my life. And so you say, this is where I'm headed and this is what I'm going to do. But maybe that's a way of controlling God because maybe God has been telling you for years, you need to do this. And you're going, I'm doing this though. I'm in control of my future. I've, I've done this. I'm going this way. But I want you to realize your need to control might show you one of your biggest areas of spiritual vulnerability and what you attempt to control the most often reveals where you trust God the least. I've set the background. What I want you to know is we are in a sermon series called Been There. And talking about control and about Jesus being there and understanding it might sound really kind of weird. Because he's the God of the universe. He is the one with authority. He is the one in control. I said earlier, there is one person who is in control. Quit trying to take it from him. Well, God is three in one. Jesus is part of that three in one. He's a triune God. So how is it that I'm going to talk about how Jesus has wrestled with or struggled with control? And to talk about that today... We're going to go back in time in more ways than one. Last week was Easter, where we talked about Jesus' coming out of the empty tomb and about him rising from the dead. But I want to talk about what led to that taking place. And so we go to the night before Jesus is killed. And that night before Jesus is killed, what ends up happening is Jesus has had the Last Supper where they all sat or stood on one side of the table for some reason. I don't know. It seems bad planning. Then, then he goes to a garden. A garden called Gethsemane. Do you guys know what Gethsemane means? Have you ever heard what Gethsemane means? I didn't know this until this week. What is it, Kenny? The wine press. It means wine press. <coughs> that will be important in a minute. As we look at Jesus being there, I want you to see Jesus in this story in Matthew chapter 26. I want you guys to follow along on the screen. If you're an analog person, you want to have control of your own Bible. It's Matthew chapter 26, and we'll be in verse 36. And what we're going to do is we're going to just walk through this story. Now, I want to set some backdrop. Jesus has predicted his death. He knows what tomorrow holds. He understands what is coming. His disciples refuse to believe it, even though they've been told upwards of three to four times, I am going to die, and I'm going to leave you. What happens in this story is you have, it's on the Mount of Olives, okay? So you're on the Mount of Olives. The garden is on the side of that. That's where the olives, the grapes were grown on vineyards on flints. It's fine. And then what ends up happening is Jesus leaves all but three down lower on the mountain. Then he goes with three up, and then he goes a little bit further from them into the garden, okay? And so that's the picture I want you to notice is happening, is you're going from multiplicity to singularity. That's a big word. He's going from a lot to a few. Palm Sunday, a lot down to a few, down to one. I'm saying all this because there's so much imagery and so much symbolism in this passage that I don't want you to miss it. The fact that he's at a place called the pressing or the crushing, the grape press, where the wine is pressed out of the grapes, right? Where you will drink new wine. Verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. 
he took Peter and two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. I'm going to take a pause. Sleeping is a small symbol of death. Okay, I want you to think about that in this story. You, you have these men who can't stay awake and they're falling asleep. To fall asleep is a, is a euphemism, is a symbol of going to death, right? So they're supposed to be watching life. They're supposed to be watching the life giver. They're supposed to be watching the author of life, yet they can't do that. He's in his biggest hour of need, yet they keep going to death. I don't know how much that's going to play in. I just needed to say it. So I needed you guys to hear that. What verse was I in? Couldn't you? Okay. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away from way unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Not the Romans, not the Jewish priests, mind you, not to Judas, into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. As we examine this familiar story, I want you to recognize that Jesus was really going through it. Jesus is the Messiah, and therefore he deserves elevation and praise. I taught this in my class in, in Philippians. There's something important for us to understand. Whenever Paul writes about Jesus Christ, he will say it in two different orders. He will say in his letters, if you go and read any of the letters and you pay attention to this, you'll notice it says Jesus Christ, and then it will say Christ Jesus. Jesus is both fully man and fully God. But when Paul is writing in his letters, he puts Christ Jesus first because Christ is focusing on the Messiah and the deity of God. And then when it's Jesus Christ, Jesus first, it's on the humanity of God. What I want us to do for a moment is to focus in on the Jesus Christ. The humanity of the God who is in the garden. That he is truly and honestly not wanting to do this. It was the will of the Father, not Jesus' will. He was hoping that he could do that, but he decides every time, I'm going to give up my control to this. And I don't know about you, but it takes him three times this is Jesus' last day on earth. He has been on earth for 33 years. And here he is on his last night saying, your will, God, your will. And it takes him three times, three times. I need to give this to you. I don't know. I'm going to go back. I need to give this to you. I need to go back. I need to give this to you. I need to release this control. And I want you to understand that there is something very beautiful to that. That is a truth for even us today. That no matter how many times you failed, no matter how many times you've gone to God and you said, I'm going to give this to you. I want to give this to you. I want to give this to you. And then you've grasped it back, even if it's the illusion of control or whatever it is that you struggle with. What I want you to recognize is that even Jesus himself said, take it, take it, take it. And, and then your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. Yet not I, but yours. Yet not I, but yours. And that is something that we can do today. And I want you to notice that here in the oil press and in the crushing, in this garden, that Jesus makes a choice as the second Adam that the first Adam could not. We are in the 
We who before we are saved, before we call Jesus as Savior, we are in the bloodline of Adam, which means we inherit all his goodness. And I'm saying that sarcastically. What Adam and Eve did in the first garden is they made a choice to take control. You can be as God. And they said, I want that. I want it. I'm going to take this out of the tree and it will be mine. Then you have Jesus in the garden, in the crushing and in the pressing. And I want you to know in that moment, at any moment, he could have said, I'm turning the other way. But he does not. He does not make the choice of the first Adam. He makes a choice that only he could make. Because so often, we can't let go. But here is Jesus saying, yet not I. Yet not I. From Adam comes death. From Jesus becomes a substitute that is a new bloodline because he wanted to begin a new family that had a different set of promises for it. And what I want you to see is Jesus has been there. However, he does what we cannot. He gives God control by the means of surrender. What I want you to know is you don't always have the power to control, but you always have the power to surrender. You don't always have the power to control the situation you're in. You don't always have the power to control what your kids are choosing to do or not do. You don't have the power to control what is going on at your job. You don't have the power to control what timeline you're set on but you have the power to surrender. Many of us sit here with clenched fists. I'm in control. I've got this. I've got a lot on my plate. And Jesus is saying, surrender, yet not I, but Christ. You can always have the power to surrender. And so, what I want you guys to think about is what you attempt to control the most often reveals where you trust God the least. If control is an illusion, then what do we need to do? Proverbs chapter 3 has something about this. You probably have this memorized. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. I'm going to say that again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. The verse does not say, trust in the Lord with 82%. It doesn't say, trust in the Lord in all things except for at sporting events. Because when it comes to that world, you can act however you want. It doesn't say when dealing with other people in business and dealing with people who are, who are maybe the way you interact with people at restaurants or the way that you interact with people in your daily lives. Submit in that way too. It says in with all our hearts and submit in all our ways. Which means no matter the circumstance, even in the smallest itty-bitty detail, we ought to surrender control over to Jesus. We don't have the power to control, but we do have the power to surrender. We can surrender, and the question is, why would I surrender? Why would I give this up? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 10, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. In this giving up, this surrender is a lifelong journey. It was a lifelong journey for Jesus. And it's a lifelong journey for us. And with my time remaining today, I want to talk about uh, some practical things. I have sat in many, many church services. I've sat in many, many sermons. I've sat in many, 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 many 
seminars and classes where we talk about all these things and we say, you need to do this. Give up control. And then it's like, all right, see ya. And there's no real tools given. But I want you to know, in the area of surrender, the Christian has a ton of tools in its tool belt. We're like Batman, fully loaded. And what I want you to know is down through the ages, Christians have done things. They're called spiritual practices or disciplines. And what these spiritual disciplines and practices are, these are things that you do not to produce the things that they're doing, but to produce the fruit that they lead to. Let me explain. Fasting. Okay? Fasting is a popular thing. I intermittent fast. I don't. I'm just saying this is hyper, 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 uh, an illusion. I don't know, metaphor. I, hyper, I uh, intermittent fast, so I only eat three hours a day, and when I do, I only eat celery sticks. I only do it because it's helped me lose 30 pounds, and I'm down to 2% body BMI. That is a byproduct of fasting because guess what? When you don't eat, what happens? You lose weight. We don't fast for that. What we do is we fast because it's a recognition. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but he lives on the word of God. We fast because we say, this thing does not have control over my life. So we don't always have to fast from just food. You can fast from other things. If it's something that's controlling you, you can fast from that and say, no, I need to spend that time that I normally would spend doing that thing and give it to you. So I encourage you this week. I'm going to have three challenges. I have three different, uh, four different spiritual disciplines. I want to challenge you to one of them. So first one is fasting. The second one is solitude. Now, solitude, you would think is something that Maybe monks do. They go off into the mountains and they walk off and they go and sit with their legs. I can't do that. Crisscross applesauce. I was about to blow my hip out. <laughs> and we sit there and we do that. And then they go. They just sit there and they become enlightened somehow. That's what we picture with solitude. I don't think that that's exactly what solitude is. Solitude is saying, God, you're so important to me that I want to give you some of my time and I don't want to give any focus on anyone else. And what solitude does is it convinces you that the world spins without you in it. Solitude says, hey, I don't have to be here, and this is still going to get done. Talk about a good antidote to control. If you're sitting there and trying to control all of these different things, and you're trying to control all these different cups, and you're saying, I'm going to get this and get this and get this done, maybe take a break from all of it and step out and see what gets done. See what happens. See what happens when you're not there. Fast. Fast from a meal or fast from sundown to sundown. That's a challenge for this week. Solitude. Go and spend time alone with no one, with no, ad no device and no agenda, but to be with God. Three. Give. Another thing we like to control is our finances. Another thing we like to do is control. Now, I'm not here to do the stereotypical tithing sermon. I'm not here to be like, you got to give. You give and it'll give you tenfold. That's not what I'm here for. What I am saying is, if the last thing that you can give control of is this thing, because you got to be in control of this, a good way to release that is to give. You can also give with your time. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are called to go to all nations. We are called to go and love our neighbors as ourselves and to give ourselves in those situations. So you can give financially, but you can also give to a cause. You can give to a need in your community, to a family in your community. Because guess what? When you serve others, you're not as important. Four is rest. I could do four sermons on rest. I'm not good at rest. But let me tell you, rest ties right into solitude. Rest says, I don't have to work seven days a week, 18 hours a day to accomplish my thing, and that my value doesn't come from my productivity. Because when we're trying to control our futures and we're trying to control what people think of us, 
We're trying to control what people assume of us. A lot of the ways we do that is work, 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 work. I'm going to do, I'm going to be more productive. I'm going to be better at you. I'm going to be better than you. I'm going to accomplish more than you, and I'm going to achieve more than you. Fast from a meal or fast from sundown to sundown. Go spend time alone in solitude. Fast in solitude. Give of your money or your time and rest. Is your God enough for rest? So put those things in your tool belt. Know that those things are available to you. That saints through the ages have found that these are the things that they need to do to accomplish sitting at the table and allowing the Holy Spirit to work on them. Fasting in itself, solitude in itself, giving in itself, and resting in itself does not produce spiritual fruit. Only the Holy Spirit can produce that. So we have to get ourselves at the table to let him do that. And I want you to know surrender is not a one-time decision. So you put that on your belt, and in six months, when you find that you're grasping back at smoke trying to control stuff, pull that out of your belt and go, all right, I need, I need to go back to Jesus. And I see, yet not I, but through Christ. I want to encourage you to not do these things to be more spiritually advanced, but to do it as an act of submission. Fast because you don't have to give in to every hunger, and it is God who gives you life. Go into solitude because your world, your business, your family can carry on even without you. Give to show that you aren't in control of your finances or time. God is. And rest because you don't have to prove anything to anybody because you're established in the name of Christ. Amen. As we get ready to sing a song, as the band comes forward, I want to pray over control. I know that I struggle with it. I know that I deal with that. And then I, I try to stay away from control because it is a shiny thing. It's like, it's like the ring in the Lord of the Rings. You, you're drawn in by it. You're like, I want this thing. It's my precious. It's that control thing. And it really is because control it's like a drug for the mind because you can sit there and look what I've done. Look what I've done. Look what I've done. Guess what? If you want to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in your life, if it's ever about you, you're wrong. If it's ever making more about you, you're wrong. Because you're sitting there going, my precious. This is me. Look what I did. Instead, release control to God. Why? So he can receive the glory. Pray with me.